Thanks again for joining today's webinar, The Sportswear Market Evolution, Trends Driving Consumer Engagement. Um, I'm Alison Branger, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. And to kick it off, I am joined by our Launchmetrics CEO, Michael Jice. And we have a few great panelists coming that I will introduce further in today's presentation. Um, but really excited to have you all here and really excited to be with such um, a fantastic group of people that can provide some great insight into what we are seeing today in this sportswear evolution. So to kick off, I know everyone is, is trying to understand, you know, what is actually happening in the market today, what it looks like. Uh, so Michael is going to walk us through the global state of sportswear, um, the voices of sportswear, who's talking, who's listening, empowering the sportswear community. So the trends, influencers, ambassadors, you need to know who's winning the race, and then a look at the future. So after actually he's told us everything to make us sound really smart, <laughs> we'll kick off our panel with, a, like I said, a great group of sportswear experts um, and wrap up with a few key takeaways. So thanks again, Michael, for, for joining. And I am going to actually hand this or hand the microphone, I should say, over to you. Thank you very much, Alison, and uh, super excited to have like this uh, stunning uh, guest uh, on stage. Uh, before that, uh, like a few insights I would like to share with you that that come from a, a, a very recent report uh, that you can download. I will give you the address at the end of uh, of this uh, slides. So basically, just a few words about Launchmetrics to start with. We really focus on the brand. We at Launchmetric, we think that the brand is really the, the most valuable asset for any fashion, luxury, and beauty brand. Uh, of course, financially speaking, uh, when you have a look at uh, like the the recent uh, M and A deals, the the, the the brand assets account for more than sixty percent of the value of of the deal. So it's 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 huge. But I think that again, uh, outside of the financial side. Uh, if you ask any CEO in the world uh, what keeps uh, them awake at night, I, I would say it's not the balance sheet, not the quarter result, it's really the momentum of the brand. And, and really at Launchmetrics, we focus on uh, how to help our customers to improve uh, the performance of their brands and uh, how to really be able to measure it. So how do we do that? So we got a global solution that starts with a holistic network of voices. By voices, we mean a different type of people to who are like media that talk on behalf of the brand. So the media, whether they are traditional, online, social media, the celebrities, influencers, the partners, and by partners, we we mean we mean it's a mix of both the, the retailers or the e-tailers of the brand, but also the collaborations between brands, and we're gonna talk about that and the brand who took for themselves what we call own media. So that are the voices. And we really like uh, integrate all the voices wherever they come, whether it's on prints, uh, more than 3000 print title, print supplement, everything that really matters from Vogue to like a, a very specific uh, sportswear titles. Obviously all the online media, more than 30,000 online publication blog and everything that matters in social around like 1 uh, million social accounts that we really uh, integrate into our panel. So that the voices, and obviously we just uh, measure it on a global reach. So not only obviously uh, Europe, US, but also China, where for the social part, we really integrate more than 10 social media, including Weibo, WeChat, Bilibili, and all the social media that matter for fashion, luxury, and beauty. So because we got all this data, then we can obviously propose a comparative, a comparative solution for all our customers. So what do we do, basically? Uh, first of all, we really help our customers improving their brand performance. So uh, they... On a usual basis, we've got more than 1,200 customers that use our solution to really engage with key opinion leaders, to really manage all their product placement initiatives 
we move more than 5 billion samples every season. They also organize digital and in-person events every year, whether it's a fashion show or a live stream. So they use our solution to do that. Obviously, they also use to share and to amplify all of their digital assets, more than 1 million lifestyle images and video that are downloaded from the Launchmetrics platform every year. And once they've been doing all this campaign to really improve the awareness, the legitimacy, and the consideration of their brand, we are able to measure and we track more than 4,000 brands on a daily basis. So we help them to improve and we help them to measure. Because in fact, you can only improve what you are able to measure. So 1,200 customers, if you take like the top 100 uh, fashion luxury brand in the world, we've got like 99% of them are the customers. But not only we sell to these uh, customers, but we are part of the industry. We're in partnership with the, the main fashion week in the world, the main luxury and watches uh, event in the world, uh, obviously also in the, in the cosmetic world, tech uh, with partnership with Google and others. So really for them, it's important not only to <clears throat> sell to the industry, but to be part of it. So just before starting defining like the, the, the figures and, and, and the great insight on the, on the report, I would like to really uh, explain a little bit uh, what is MIV. Uh, just generally speaking, as I said it before, we got like all the voices that matter. So we got somehow the system, but to really be uh, in measure to, to really understand what comes from this data, we had to define our own currency. So our currency is called Media Impact Value. So it's an AI powered uh, benchmarking system that allow to really give a value to any publication for all the brand, whether it's print, online or social, with two type of attribute that we weight, that is our secret source to weight it and to give a value. But we take into account two types of attributes, quantitative ones like reach, the engagement, the advertising rates, the, the frequency of the posting, et cetera. And also qualitative that are at least uh, as important as the quantitative ones like the content quality, the relevancy of the content, but also the authority of the sources and, and much more than that. Altogether, it's more than 100 attributes that we mix in order to define our media impact value and to make it evolve every week, depending on the importance and the relative growth or decrease of some medias or, or social media. So that's how we value uh, these voices and that allow, to, allow us to give like a dollar, a monetary value to every post. That said, what does it say in terms of uh, sportswear market? The first figure I would like to, to share with you for 2022 is the overall value. The, the total is $7 billion in media impact value. It's huge. Uh, if, you, if, if you just want to compare it, uh, we just recently released uh, like the, the importance of uh, Festival de Cannes, Cannes Festival uh, uh, for fashion, luxury, and brand, for fashion and luxury brands. Basically, Festival de Cannes is probably like the the, the most important uh, event on the planet when it comes to fashion luxury. And it was like 700 million. So 7 billion is, is really a big figure. Now, if we want to really analyze uh, where it comes from, of course, uh, US, America is first with 2.7 billion, followed by EMEA. But what I, what I would like to really underline is the uh, uh, importance of Asia and the, the really impressive growth of Asia, because if you include China into a pack, it's even more important in terms of media value, impact value than, than the US. But a growth that was like 52% year over year for China and 27% for APAC, excluding China. So a growing importance of Asia in the sports market, and we'll come back to that. Now, if we just uh, deep dive into like who is talking and who is listening, and we try to understand who are the voices that, that really matter in 2022 and, and what are the change compared to 2021. So basically, altogether, the, the, the most important voice in 2022 is media. By media here, 
just just to make sure that we're on the same page, we really understand like media both on print, online, and social. And I think that somehow it's how media have been like uh, really integrating into this like uh, expanding uh, social sphere by really uh, giving a, a huge importance to to the social social part of it. And somehow they appear as like uh, really uh, the the winner of. Uh, of like this mix. Uh, so not only they represent more than 55% of the overall media impact value, but they've been growing like 19% in 2022. At the same time, we could see also a decrease of the celebrity part compared to 2021, probably linked to the fact that in 2021, we had the Olympic Games in Tokyo. So I can explain that uh, the, the, the part of athletes that is a big part of celebrity has decreased in 2022. And what we can note also is in, in, in increase of influencers and own, and more than that, the increasing part of what we call partners into it. So by partner here, as I said, in, initially when I explained the voices, we mean uh, retailers and retailers, but more than that, I think that the increased part of partners come from like the, the growth of collaborations. Uh, we'll come back to that with, with an example but you can see it like every day, the, the number of collaboration, the sportwear business between sportwear and other segments, whether it's luxury or others, is really becoming more and more important. And you can see that in the figures uh, in 2022. If we now try to focus on influencers very quickly, sorry, I tend to, to get back. Uh, what is interesting is that, uh, I will be quick, I, I, I swear, uh, is the, the important uh, growth of micro-influencers compared to the other year. So, of course, here we try to really segment influencers depending on their, their, the number of followers. What we call micro influencers are the ones that have less than 100,000 followers. And of course, all influencers have been growing because influencers are growing in general in the sportwear industry. But here, it's interesting to note the growing importance of micro influencers. The way I explain that is to say, okay, somehow in the sports uh, industry, in sportswear industry compared to, to fashion, uh, Basically, the agility of the of the sport are the athletes, right? So somehow you use the athletes for creating awareness and legitimacy, and micro influencer for business uh, conversion and transformation and loyalty. So that, that can explain, in my opinion, the, the increasing part of uh, of micro influencers in the mix. Two examples I would like to share with you uh, today about uh, what these trends. Uh, micro influencers, I said it. Uh, I mean, this uh, this influencer like uh, Crystal Daniel, that is a micro influencer. Uh, he's like uh, was fifteen thousand followers, which is not big, but his collaboration with Fabletics uh, did create like uh, an impressive like one hundred eighty one k in media impact value, which for a micro influencer is really huge, and uh, that illustrates, uh, in my opinion, the the. the, the the growing importance of micro influencers uh, in, in the panel. So in terms of uh, mid-tier type of voice, and of course, I, I guess that Franklin will, will tell it, uh, will say it better than I do, uh, but we can see like uh, a lot of uh, growing trends uh, regarding like uh, the influence of, uh, of this type of ambassadors for sportswear trend, consumer preference and brand visibility. What I really would like to focus on that there is one trend that I found really interesting in uh, in uh, in uh, all that uh, Franklin is doing, and that we really started to analyze with our re TikTok report like uh, one year ago, uh, which is the unboxing. Uh, we did analyze that unboxing like generated a lot of interest and surprise, and that was like probably one of the main trends uh, on, on on videos for uh, fashion luxury. And what uh, Franklin is doing with his uh, What's in the Box series, that I think he reads like every week, isn't it, on Wednesday, uh, to showcase a gifted product, is really like uh, the, the best illustration of, of this approach, uh, which is a very interesting method to organically enhance visibility and, and generate significant impact for streetwear brand amongst, uh, amongst his audience. So. That's it for the trends.
two other examples I would like to share with you. Uh, obviously, uh, that would be like uh, super sad not to, to talk about that because it, the, the main trend, it's really like the sneakerhead trend. Sneakers represent more than 43% of the total MIV of sportswear. And for sportswear as a whole, but if you dig into that, and even on the luxury segment, sneaker represent more than 30% of the luxury segment. It's huge. And uh, we believe at Montreal that probably from next year, it will be uh, over 50% of the total MIV. So not only it's huge, but it, it's going to grow uh, in, the, in, the, in the years to come. Best example of this connection between sneaker, sportswear, and luxury is the campaign between Gucci and Adidas that generated 96.5 million in MIV in 2022. Just to give you an example, uh, a, a very, very successful fashion show for Gucci uh, generates 20 million of MIV. So here, this campaign represents probably more than five times, five seasons of a uh, fashion show for Gucci. So it's really important. So who are the winners? So here we've been uh, like uh, analyzing the top 20 most powerful brands in sportswear in 2022. So the first one is Nike with 2.6 billion, followed by Adidas with 215. The third one, New Balance, is probably like uh, five times less in terms of uh, media impact value. So of course, I let you uh, read the list, but but more than the list itself, there are some comments I would like to share with you. The first one is for me the emergence of like two Chinese brands into like the the top ten, like Anta and, and Lining. So Anta maybe even before Converse, and uh, that's quite impressive. That that could be also linked this, this success to the fact that in 2021, they, benefic they benefited from the, um, like the, uh, the, the massive uh, coverage of the uh, Olympic Games in, in Tokyo. But more than that, I think it's also about the, the, the winning like influencer and celebrity strategy, especially with the NBA for lining and like more globally for, for Anta. And I think that for me, it also... Uh, illustrates the, um, the, the, the the emergence and the growing presence of a uh, Chinese brand into into uh, the the landscape. Uh, Anta also owns uh, uh, Salomon with the acquisition of Amber Sport, and they also represent Fila in China. So I think that this is something that is also uh, a notable a notable event, and probably it's going to grow in 2023 onwards. Uh, the other comment I would like to share with you is the fact that two brands only uh, uh, from this panel were not present like 15 years ago, like it's uh, Gymshark and Allo Yoga. That's it for uh, for the brands. And just to finish, really like four uh, like um, I would say generic uh, takeaways. The first one, seven billion in 2022, probably going to eight billion in 2023. Uh, growth is exponential due to the business opportunity and obviously the the connection with uh, other segment of the of the fashion apparel, but not only with uh, other segment of the market. Um, second comment is really like uh, the mix and the emergence of micro influencers into that mix, uh, significant in terms of influence, but also I think in terms of mix like mixing athletes and micro influencers could be the winning combination for influence and uh, marketing strategies, celebrities like athletes for awareness, consideration and legitimacy, and micro influencers for business conversion and uh, and uh, and loyalty. Third takeaway: the importance of sneakers. Forty-three percent of total MIV, thirty percent of the luxury segment. So really like, uh, and I think that we are at the beginning, we, we foresee it to represent more than 50% in 2023. So it's, it's really like a growing phenomenon. And last but not least, the connection between luxury and streetwear collaborations linked also to the collaboration uh, increase that somehow reshapes sportwear. We, we show that with Gucci and Adidas more than five fashion weeks. 
But again, I think that it highlights not only the potential for uh, maximizing ROI, but also to reach new audiences, and that that's that, that's the the goal for for this type of collaborations. And we think that this luxury uh, uh, sneaker segment will probably like uh, have a bright future, uh, and we we'll start to analyze that at launch metrics from 2023. That's it, what that I, I wanted to share with you. Obviously, it's just a, a summary of a lot of data and insights that we invite in, in our in our report, like Sportswear Insights. Uh, so, of course, like go on our website and download it. And uh, and that's it. Uh, I hope that you will have like a, a great time with our panelists and Alison, give you the floor. And, uh, and I'm super excited to hear uh, what uh, your panel has to share with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for that insight. And now at least you've given me a few things to say during the panel. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Well, I'll take this opportunity to say goodbye to Michael and welcome our panelists to the stage. So Franklin, Trey, and Lucy, if you guys would like to turn on your camera. Um, in the meantime, um, I'd like to welcome Franklin, King of Trainers, to the stage, um, Trey Laird, the Chief Executive and Chief Creative Officer of Team Laird, and Lucy, who is the Senior Trends Editor at Vogue Business. So, great. I am going to actually stop sharing the screen because it's always awkward when um, there's a big picture of you and small picture, small camera pictures. Um, so I think this will be much better, but. Thanks again. I'm really happy that you guys could join today's uh, conversation. For those of you also tuning in to join today's conversation, you know, throughout our um, webinar, Michael's talked a little bit about the, the different voices impacting the customer's, let's say, path to purchase when it comes to the world of sportswear. We've talked about this dynamic evolution of the voice and personal branding in the sportswear industry. One thing, you know, for me that I think is really interesting that I want to dig into with today's panelist is, you know, the significance of brand narratives, the emotional connection to strategically bridge that brand consumer gap. Um, and yeah, I think there's there's a lot actually that we can dig into. So uh, as we're talking about brand, Trey, I feel like some people would call you like the, we have the king of trainers, we have the king of brand, you know, I don't know if you've tried that title, it probably doesn't work. You could probably, you know, give me something a little sexier. I'm, I'm going to let Franklin own that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, maybe because you've developed some of the most innovative campaigns for obviously the world's most iconic fashion and lifestyle brands, Tommy Hilfiger, Calvin Klein, obviously Hugo Boss, you know, in your opinion and expertise, what makes a strong sports or brand narrative? I think, uh, first of all, thanks for, for having me. I'm happy to be here. Um, you know how I think about it? I think about brands like people. And when you think about the people that we want in our lives and the people that we connect to and that move us, for me, it's people that are authentic, that have a purpose, that have a clear point of view, you know who they are, you know what you can count on them for. And so to me, I think of brands sort of develop the best brands that have those same sort of characteristics. And to me, when you, when you show up that way, that's what creates community. That's what creates connection. And ultimately, that's what creates a true relationship. Um, and, and it lasts over time. So to me, I think for it's just always been the easiest way to think of it that way, as opposed to this sort of like corporate strategic conceptual thing. I just think on a human level, you want that experience with something and you want the experience something that you can authentically believe in and connect with. Um, and especially in the, the sportswear market where you're talking about categories, it was interesting looking at that list that was just up, you know, we talk about sneakers, a sneaker is basically the same thing amongst 20 brands, right? It functions the same, it sort of is somewhat the same shape, it has the same purpose, but every single one of them has an addition, different emotional meaning based on the brand. And if you're wearing a Travis Scott Cactus Jack sneaker, that's very different than if you're wearing a brand new, you know, 990 New Balance reissue. 
Um, they're very similar, but just some little detail and, and all the emotion that goes into the branding of it and the storytelling of it, that's what sets it apart. So I don't know, that's that's for at least for me, the way I've always thought about brands and especially when I'm creating a, a brand strategy. And sorry, just to follow up, you know, who? what do you think is a brand that's really done that successfully and been able to connect with the customer? And what do you think the customer kind of feeling or response has been? Well, I mean, the greatest of all time, obviously, is Nike. I mean, it's almost so obvious it's hard to say it, but it's true. Um, you know, whenever you're on these panels or anything and somebody talks about Apple or Nike, I'm sure there's a lot of people that roll their eyes, but but there's a reason why those brands are so present in our lives and our hearts and our, you know, we, we have such a strong emotional connection. And I think Nike has been the greatest at really connecting on an emotional level to why they exist as a company way beyond product. But then at the same time, they've been the greatest example to always stay relevant, to always stay fresh, to surprise, delight, disrupt. Um, and really tap into so many different cultural connections too. Obviously, the most iconic, you know, sporting heroes, starting with Jordan, but then also, as I just mentioned, Travis and what they're doing with Cast and you know, Cactus Jack, just just the the pulse of relevance and people just waiting for every little color or detail or this one's wrapped in a bandana, but we don't know when it's coming out, or you know, whatever it is. Um, <laughs> They, they've been able to tap into the worlds of fashion with what they're doing with Jacques Mousse right now. It's in so many different areas. I think they've just stayed so relevant, but at the same time, so true to themselves. Um, so it's, you know, in many ways, the greatest brand ever created. I mean, obviously, that's why we're doing this Portsmouth Report now to coincide with the launch of Air. <laughs> I think desperate missing. Oh, sorry. I, th I think what's interesting as well about Nike is that they have this hyper local approach. So even though the revenues are above 45 billion, they're one of the biggest apparel companies in the world, they have hyper-local teams that have kind of a, a hall pass to make decisions really quick. So let's say like in London or in Amsterdam, there's a trend bubbling up, there's a, a sports star bubbling up that's hyper-local. That local team can decide to go all in and create products, create events, create campaigns without having to go through loads of red tape. So it just means that that relevance can happen like across the globe. Yeah. I think that's a great point. And I think, you know, Adidas, to, to be fair, does of the a very similar thing. Like, you know, we were just seeing all the amazing slides about the Gucci partnership and it was this blockbuster thing. But, you know, a couple of years ago, there's a, a quite emerging at this point, US based brand called Cape. And they did a special, you know, edition collab with Adidas. And arguably most of the world doesn't know that brand. I think it probably has a very low brand awareness now. But the but it's quite a big impact and quite a big influence and, and fast emerging. And so the people that do love it, it says a lot about Adidas and their sort of, you know, being on the beat and on the pulse. And to Lucy's point, I think that was probably more of a hyper local thing versus a big global, you know, visible partnership like the Gucci collab. But both are incredibly important and probably very uh, similar to, again, in the previous deck, the emergence of, of micro influencers and the, you know, the power of, again, authenticity. Absolutely. Um, you know, one thing I've been thinking about, Lucy, is the, you know, it, the sportswear phenomena is, is not like a big surprise to me coming out of COVID in some way, because we, we saw the athleisure boom. Um, but it, it's almost not just athleisure anymore. I don't know. But I love, you know, as someone that covers trends, covers sportswear, you know, what do you think is happening in the market really? Like, obviously we showed you the data, but how do you say the preferences and the expectations of these consumers have evolved? Um, and how do you think the brands are reacting to engage kind of with this demand? So I think that how we wear sportswear has really been revolutionized, particularly with the Gen Z consumer. So obviously, as you mentioned, we saw it really thrive during the pandemic. Then in 2022, people kind of shifted a bit of spending to return to work. Where we've got to in 2023 is a kind of hybrid of the two, where people are looking for sportswear that, you know, they can wear to work, they can wear to the office, and then maybe they can wear to do Pilates at the end of the day. And brands are really responding to that. And um, so particularly with the Gen Z consumer, Adidas actually did its first sort of label launch in many, many, many years in February of this year. And actually the collection is called Sportswear. But what it is, is more fashion focused, 
but fashion focused pieces, but with performance elements. So it was for that Gen Z consumer that wants to wear their sportswear all day. And maybe they will exercise in it, but actually it's the aesthetic of performance that they're really into based off of the back of pandemic trends. And I think another thing that we're really seeing is a lot of the challenger brands. So there was a few challenger brands lower down on the list, like Allo Yoga or Gymshark. They are really community led um, brands that have a founder kind of at the center. And you see that with brands like Tala as well, which is a little bit smaller. And it's these founder stories that I think young consumers are really interested in in sportswear as well. And there's a brand I just covered actually that's not even a sportswear player called Represent based in the UK. And they turned over 50 million nearly last year. And sportswear forms a huge part of their offering. And what happens is the founder just goes to the gym every single day and poses in the, the sportswear. And there's a whole community then around exercising and represent based on the founder and its, his community. Um, so I think that's another really interesting shift that we're seeing as well. I think that actually brings me to like a really good point for, for Franklin. You know, in this new world um, and how we talk to consumers and what Trey said about this kind of personal relationship between the brand and the audiences, um, obviously you as a creator has be have become the link between the two so many times because actually every single day you're you're having this dialogue, these conversations with your audience. They believe in you. They believe in what you stand for. Um, you have this emotional connection with them. You know, how do you feel like you've built this authentic following with your audience and how do you think brands should be leveraging or how are they leveraging, you know, you as this kind of middleman? Yeah, um, no, thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to be on the panel with some esteemed uh, guests. Um, and so with me, I think it's just having a personal touch, a personal connection. Um, like what I do, like, you know, I have this kind of online profile, King of Trainers, for those who don't know. Um, I actually address the people who follow me as the kingdom. So we're all part of one big family. And what I try to do is I try to engage directly with each individual person who, who interacts with me. You know, and that could be via um, commenting back to the comment they've left on a post that I've done, um, sending a DM, giving information, you know, um, and it, it makes people feel just connected, just even just replying back to the DM, or even when you try to, I follow as many people as I can back, and just liking their posts, giving them a thumbs up, giving them some encouragement, they seem as a real person, you know, um, and that kind of helps to really connect. And I see like a lot of brands actually see this, and then that's how they, they contact me to kind of do collaborations and work with them. And, you know, in the report, we keep talking about the, the growth of micro influencers. And it was something crazy, like over 50% growth yeah. to media impact value. Yeah. Am I yeah. on mute? Oh, no. Okay, no, sorry. Yeah. You know, obviously, in the technical challenges of webinars, I was on mute before than I wasn't on mute because okay. I didn't want to forget to unmute. <laughs> Um, you know, how do you see the power of micro influencers growing and contributing to the the formation of the community around sports or brands? Yeah, I, I always say because I, I also teach social media, and I always say micro influencers are probably more important um, overall than like mega influencers because they have they may have a smaller um, following, they have a, a, a higher engagement. You know, so they can have um, a following of maybe five thousand to ten thousand, but they might get like a thousand likes or whatever which is a is a is a, is a, a higher percentage or a, a bigger engagement than someone who's got like a couple million followers and with micro influencers they can kind of tell a more kind of personal direct story you know they're not influenced by too much of that the branding and the, the corporate side they can kind of relate to people because um even you know i'm probably a little bit more than a micro influencer but what i try to also do is i try to like because i have, have stores i'm very present you know I go to events, I shake hands. Um, you know, recently I went to um, um, a podcast show and I dressed up with my crown, my robe, and I was um, just shaking hands and taking pictures. And that kind of builds that connection of, he's not actually, you know, too far away from us. You know, we can do what, what he can do or what she can do. And I think that's where micro influencers have a, a, a massive impact and be relatable. I was waiting for you to say, I go to events, I shake hands, I kiss babies. Yeah, well, <laughs> I've done that before. So it's, we're, it's all we're part of the, it's all part of the job. And um, you know, I think the theme today is really about like that personal connection, and um, and maybe that is the winning strategy when you want to target Gen Z or Gen Z, as we say here in the UK. Um, yeah. you know, Lucy, I'd love to hear as you're kind of a specialist in the area. You know, there are obviously a lot of stereotypes and um 
consumer behaviors that many of us still don't understand when it comes to this generation? You know, how do you, or what are your suggestions? Um, what are the challenges maybe? And then what are the suggestions for the brands to overcome those challenges? So I think that the inspiration journey with Gen Z has completely changed. It's completely different than we've seen with any other generation. And what I mean by that is, and it actually touches on what we've talked about, you know, the difference between these micro influencers and these all-star influencers and the impact they can have. I think all-star influencers are great, like in terms of athletes in sportswear, for the inspiration phase. So they can maybe spark the idea to buy into a brand or buy a product. But what we're seeing Gen Z then do is they will see, you know, a celebrity wearing something, an athlete wearing something, and then they do a lot of research. And this can account for about a quarter of the purchase journey, just looking into the product, looking into the quality, the fit. And they search this on social media more than a search engine, more often than not. So they will be looking for, and I know and we mentioned unboxings earlier, they'll be looking for unboxings of the product, hauls of the brand, and people trying on the products and seeing what the quality is like. And this accounts for, you know, sportswear, but also all fashion. And they really have this added layer of research that brands need to be aware of because that's a place actually to intercept them and drive them to purchase. And one really interesting phenomenon that we've seen with this is dupes. So in this research phase, that's where maybe a Gen Z will say, okay, cool. I've seen some Lululemon leggings, but they're $98 or they're 98 pounds. Um, is there a cheaper alternative? And actually loads and loads of brands like Lululemon have been subject to dupe videos on TikTok where an influencer will show, or just it's just user generated content typically, and will show some leggings that maybe are in their Amazon storefront for 20 pounds that they say have the same result as the Lululemon. What brands can do in response to this specifically and what Lululemon did, which is very clever, is they arranged a dupe swap in LA. So they took over, they did a pop-up in a mall in LA in early May. And they said, okay, come and bring your Lululemon dupes and we'll give you a free pair of our Align leggings and we'll show you the quality. And the hope with that was that that would be an entry point for new consumers into Lululemon who maybe hadn't brought, bought the leggings before and were thinking that dupes could, could offer the same, offer the same quality and fit. Um, so I think that's really interesting and a really interesting way that a brand has intercepted that research phase that's really, really important now with our younger consumers. I love that idea. Um, and I have never heard of that. That's super interesting. Um, so besides giving away or doing a lot of pop-ups, Trey, um, you obviously also kind of work in the space, helping brands really set a strategy to create a differentiation um, for their brand in the market, communicating their unique value proposition and, and standing out. You know. I guess, you know, what are the strategies you recommend to your clients and that you can recommend to people on this call? Um, I think I think the most important thing we touched on earlier is having a unique point of view and not being a, a Me Too brand that's chasing a trend or chasing another brand. Um, it happens a lot in this space. Um, you know, every every brand has their version of a Stan Smith, right? Like from... Alexander McQueen to this one to that, like there's every single brand has their version of it. Um, and so you can participate in a trend, but you can't build a unique brand uh, proposition on something like that. So I think to really just stand out and have your own unique point of view, I think Allo is a is a perfect example. Uh, as Lucy said, it's it's very community led. They've got a very focused aesthetic. It's quite quickly become in its own way, a status symbol, I think, amongst a certain type of consumer. And I think they've been they've been very, very strong with their content strategy and it's been very focused in the way they've allowed people to participate in their brand ethos um, and their sensibility. So I think whether it's large or small, um, you know, I've, I've said enough praises about Nike, um, but I think it's it's that, just having your own unique point of view. And that's the best way to stay relevant and stay authentic. I think um, when brands spotlight their community, um, even inside and outside of sports, where we see it with a lot of the like high growth brands in the apparel space, they are the ones that will, you know, include those share content of their customers wearing their outfits on their TikTok, on their Instagram. The community feel like part of the brand story because they're they're just they're not influencers, they're nano nano, but they feel like they're you know they're part of the brand family because they put on their their leggings and then they posted it and it's been shared by the brand. So yeah, that's really powerful. I totally agree. Super, super powerful. I mean, this brand isn't in sportswear, but I think it's the best example of Lucy's point. But you know that that it's a fairly small brand, the Frankie Shop. And, and to me, the Frankie Shop is about their community. And the community really is that runway. And it really is their connection to the world. And it's so powerful. 
And it, it, it's their campaign, if you will, is, is embracing and, and sharing their community, bringing their, their brand to life. Um, so it, whether it's sportswear or not, you know, I think it's, it's just the practice and the ethos of it. Um, you know, I've, I've lost my train of thought, but, um, I. You're thinking about the Frankie shot now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I'm, let, me just add to, let me just add to yeah, it. Perfect. Um, it's, it's also important when you see like major brands doing, um, like smaller kind of pop-ups, you know, so you kind of see um, like pop-ups with smaller, with other brands, you know, like I'm, I'm around um, the, the, the London Shoreditch area and um, we've got like a, a brand called Averex, which is seen like as a, as, a, as a big brand, but we've got a small pop-up shop and every day people go past and say, oh my God, Averex, I didn't know you guys were here. And it's because we're so localized, you know, and then like part of my, my what I try to do is I say, look, we don't even want you to buy it. Just try it on. Just try on. Just try on the jacket. And then that feeling of trying on like a very expensive jacket, even though they know they're not going to buy it, just and they take pictures. Then we've got like a big wall that says Averix, and I, I take. I'm the one that's taking a picture of them. And they're like, you know, so I'm on my knees trying to get the right angles and things like that. And, I, and that's kind of builds that kind of uh, relationship. You know, like this this guy, he doesn't have to do this, but he's really kind of making us feel part of it, even though we're not going to buy it. You know. So that's kind of one of the things that we, we try to do. That's great. And my, I did remember my comment. It was the Frankie shop that threw me off. But, you know, pre-COVID, we were talking all about like the KOC in China, the key opinion customer. And really, micro influencers are in a way an extension of that. And what you're saying, too, like, Franklin, the concept of making people a, feel a part of a community. I mean, we have an audience question that says, you know, how can brands build authenticity? authenticity and I, I think this is kind of part of it it's everything you guys have been saying this personal branding this community this I'm I'm not on the other side we're one so you're a customer but you're an influencer but you're I don't know a, a, a member of this clan um you know this this like a, we always say like the Gucci group when Gucci used to have like those crazy runway shows where people would be carrying their heads down the runway and then everybody would do it it's because they wanted to be a part of kind of that network and now like you said user generated contact content has also made fans kind of participants so i'm going to do one audience question um and then we're getting or two audience questions and i think we're getting close to the end um you know for anybody what would your advice be to a brand looking to enter this market um and maybe franklin for you to any tips on building that community to 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 help kind of foster that growth yeah, um, my advice for brands is to just care about your customer, really kind of home in and listen to customer service. I think your customer service needs to be at the, the, the height of any type of campaign. And that customer service, like they say, like, um, you know, the good news spreads fast um, and the bad news spreads faster. So you want to kind of make sure that you're really um, listening to exactly what your customer wants and making them feel like, um, like, okay, how do we develop this new product and, and stuff like that, you know, like, like, for example, not, not to go back to Nike, but Nike have different kind of focus groups they do locally in different countries and, okay, what can we do next? And they, they ask questions and, and things like that, you know, and it's, and I think that's kind of, for me, the key thing. I think, I believe the days of putting up a big billboard and everyone just looks at the billboard and goes or buy it, buys it, it's just gone. You need to really kind of be like, okay, who is our customer? How do we speak to our customer? And, and where do we engage with our customer? And that's kind of where you have to kind of really look at um, as a brand. Your customers are your biggest advertisers at the end of the day. Yeah, I totally agree. And I also think if you're a brand founder starting out, document and be really honest about the journey because actually audiences really love they love a founder story, as I mentioned earlier, but also they love it when, you know, maybe brands, maybe your orders haven't come on time and deliveries are going to be a bit slow. Put out an Instagram post and, and show you warehouse and show you in it and say, oh, yeah, we're really struggling right now with orders, but we're going to we're going to work better so that this doesn't happen next season. You'll get your orders soon. And more often than not, when brands do that kind of thing, the comments are no worries, standing by you, love you guys. Um, it's when brands are not honest about the drawbacks and they don't tell their story throughout that customers are kind of a bit turned off. They want to feel like part of the brand story and part of the fabric of the brand. Um, so I think like if you're just starting out a brand, document everything because 
some brands then they can produce amazing YouTube documentaries or books about their journey and people lap it up. They love it. Um, so a lot of brands are really focused on Gen Z or Gen Z. Uh, what about other loyal customers? You know, what are the tactics that work to target them and how can, you know, people leverage, you know, those other marketing channels or those other voices? Um, should I go? Oh. <laughs> Whoever. Um, no, I mean, I, I think I, I think all customers are, 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 val are, are valued and a way to kind of reach them is kind of not 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 kind of single out any other group, but do focused events for these types of people. You know, um, uh, we have a, a, a retro store here and we do like events for for people. It's like a, it's a, an event where we do like uh, old school music and that's kind of maybe for people 30 and up <laughs> do you I mean not to kind of you know and then we use that that event to to then folk, um, look at our, our, our products which are kind of like retro and and, and uh, old school sportswear you know that people can remember so there's sometimes you just have to kind of do little things for different groups you know not you know excluding the the rest of your, your client base or, or customer base but you know just kind of do something for everyone, didn't do small things for everyone else. I think that's why it's important to use different platforms and different creators and influencers as well. Because, you know, some of these things I've been talking about in this research phase, perhaps the millennial or Gen X consumer isn't doing as much research, but that first inspiration ambassador that you've got or the, the Instagram content, the aspirational Instagram content that you produce, don't stop doing that, but just maybe add on, you know, working with unboxing content and, um, you know, working with nano influencers and micro influencers to try out your products on TikTok. It's just adding another layer rather than pivoting completely to Gen Z and leaving all the other content behind. Um, that stuff's really so, really so powerful, you know, with, with other consumers and platforms like Facebook, Facebook groups around brands are still really, really successful. Um, so I think, you know, leaving, leaving previous strategies there if they're working and just adding layers on top for younger consumers. Yeah, I, I mean, I totally agree. I think it's, it's not so much about this generation versus that generation. As, as Franklin said, all customers are important and valued. How you connect with them may be different depending on different targets. But I think it's also about showing up consistently and then using these different tactics or platforms to connect in different ways. But you as a brand, your point of view, your voice, um, how you how you show up is consistent. And if you try to be one way for one generation and then flip flop and another way for another generation, I, I just think, again, that doesn't lead to a very um, authentic, believable point of view. It's usually disastrous and people see right through it. But if you are consistent and you do have a clear point of view, and then you can connect with maybe one audience on TikTok or another audience with events or another audience in experiential ways or whatever it is, then that can be really powerful. I think that's a great kind of note to end on too. Um, you know, I uh, I know we did talk a lot about Gen Z or Gen Z, but I, I read about this, you know, during the pandemic and how brands were shifting their marketing strategies to be less about age and more about, you know, what people are interested in, hobbies and mind, body, soul. So as you said, you know, think about who your brand is, think about the anchor you want to anchor it in and go with that, find the channel to maybe talk to the that audience about that theme, but maybe don't change who you are. Thank you guys so, so much for joining. Um, it's been a great afternoon having you and having you share your insight and wisdom. Oh, we're getting some like clap it, virtual claps. <laughs> um, for everyone in the audience, I'm going to do a, a quick little wrap up, but for my lovely panelists, feel free to, to take your bows and, and exit the stage. And thank you again for your time and, and joining thank today. You. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye Lucy. Bye Franklin. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Lucy. Bye. Thanks Alison. Thank you. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen so we can um, continue on our panel. Okay, great. Oh, let me just put you in and that should be good. So I hope you guys found the conversation as insightful as I did. I really appreciated Franklin, Trey, and Lucy again for, for joining us and sharing their insight. And obviously, I, I hope you found Michael, um, you know, sharing the data from the report 
as a, as a great kind of setting to kick off today's conversation about the evolution of sportswear. Um, you should all be getting an email to download a full copy of the report, but if you are eager beaver as I am talking, you can go to launchmetrics.com to download a full copy right now. Um, you know, today we've spoken so far a little bit about the trends of the past and, you know, the future, and I'm hoping we have inspired you as a sports or brand or somebody that works adjacent to the sportswear industry about how you can create a stronger connection with your consumer as you embark on this journey of improving your brand's performance. So, you know, as Launchmetrics is the brand performance cloud for lifestyle brands, I thought it was my responsibility as a CMO to not only inspire you with these inspiring people, but to give you a few of my tips and tricks on what makes a great marketing strategy. So I do want to spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the concept of, you know, investing in the right tools and metrics to stay at the top of your competitive market. Obviously, data is amazing and it's so helpful to make informed decisions, but without all of the the tools to analyze that data and to actually make sense of it, it's very hard to understand what you're going to do with all this data that your brand is producing. I think at the same time, especially as a CMO, I'm managing so many different teams. So being able to standardize those KPIs and put all of that data into one dashboard really helps me understand and have a clear view of what's working and what's not. Um, I think today, obviously, in the panel, we've spoken a lot about finding the right voice and the right channel to connect with your audiences. Obviously, we hear now in sportswear, it's all about the, the micro-influencer. Um, Franklin's also obviously shared a lot of his tips and tricks on how brands can be activating that micro-influencer. Um, and then... Obviously, the most other important takeaway that we've talked a little bit about is improving your operational efficiency. And unfortunately, you know, I know this is a question from the audience, but we didn't have a chance to, to get into it, but about how brands can be more responsible um, and, of course, reduce their carbon footprint. You know, we know that change is hard and especially for established brands, but it's obviously necessary to talk about a lot of this, you know, waste is coming from the fact that brands don't have operational efficiency to create sustainable practices. So as marketers, even though maybe we don't do production, it's our job to make sure that our brands are thinking ethically and having this top of mind. So before I let you go, I want to dig into a little bit of what this means. So investing in the right tools and metrics, you know, as I started to say, before you can implement change, you have to see where you are in the market. You need to see how you performed against last season, last year, but then also how you're performing against your competitors. And that's the only way you can really set proper KPIs to understand where you need to go, right? So maybe the trend is micro-influencers, but maybe you're already exceeding in micro-influencers. And so you just need to kind of keep going ahead on that same path. But perhaps, you know, for all the other voices, you're not as strong and you can see your competitors are actually eating your share of the market. So having the right tools and the right data and the right metrics can help you set those KPIs so you know how you should be arbitrating your budget to get the biggest, as we say in America, bang for your buck. The second thing that I started to talk about that, of course, has been evident across this entire panel is having the right voice for your brand, right? So if you want to build a personal connection, you need to understand how these different voices, whether it's the different tiers of influencers or the different voices like celebrity, media, influencers, partners in your own media, you need to understand how all of those activations, all of those voices are impacting your customer's path to purchase. Um, and then you need to know what questions to ask yourself to see if it's working or if it's not working. Or maybe you need to be able to see if it's working in one country, but it's not working in another. So obviously at Launch Metrics, we say you can have the data, but you need to know how to use the data to set your strategy. And lastly, you know, you need to understand the efficiency of your strategy. You need the metric to tell you how your efforts are distributed and what is the average value you're receiving and how it stands out from your competitors. You know, it's great to have a PR team that's sending out samples all the time to different magazines and to different influencers like Franklin. But if you're not getting that ROI, not only are you being wasteful, not only are you creating a huge carbon footprint with all of the send outs, all of the couriers, all of the shipping, 
Um, but it, it's not worth anything. So obviously having the right tools to create that operational excellence, even for something so unsexy like sample management is a great way for you to optimize your resources to make sure you're being quite lean and mean um, with how you're managing your sustainable practices. So at Launch Metrics, you know, we focus on the launch and the metric. So really helping our brands understand, you know, what's working and what's not. So creating the right tools and processes to build operational efficiency and then to measure and benchmark your brand's performances and all of those different types of activations to understand what's working and what's not working. So that sums up today's webinar. I'm really excited um, for you all to get a copy of the report and read it. I really appreciate everyone for tuning in. Um, and thanks again to our wonderful panel and guest speakers. Uh, head over to launchmetrics.com or wait for a lovely email from my marketing team um, and download the report today. Hope to see you on our next webinar. Um, and if we missed any of your questions, I'm really sorry, but I will um, wait for the marketing team to come back to me with any questions we missed. But if you have a hot question that you can't wait for, feel free to send us an email. Thanks so much and have a great rest of your day, guys.